Hi, I'm Paul Kasabian, I'm a structural engineer, and I've been lucky enough to work on modular structures in a number of different ways in my career. Um, I've designed some that go into a full building, I've designed individual modular structures for a modular startup that wanted to build a, a bunch of them all around the United States, um, and genuinely consulted for different people wanting to do modular design or modular construction or help them out when they've had some problems with modular projects designed and built by others. So given that modular structures in general is being talked about a lot these days in the construction industry, I thought I would put together some of my thoughts, things I've learned um, about modular structures, design and construction, from my viewpoint as a structural engineer, but also as someone who has seen a lot that I think my understanding goes beyond just the specifics of structures. And I wanted to share some of my thoughts and experiences with you so that if you're considering getting a modular structure, designing one, building one, starting a company that's going to do it, or you have some issues, that these are some of the things that might help you in that. So fun fact, I'm actually listed as a co-inventor on a patent for foldable building units, which relates to a time when my client was a firm called Blue Homes that uh, developed and built a whole series of uh, foldable modular structures. Um, so the key benefit of modular structures is that they save time. The idea here is that instead of the traditional construction schedule where everything happens in sequence on the construction site, you save time because while the site development and foundation work is going on, you can be building the modular structures themselves indoors in a factory setup. Right? So you, you can do two parts of construction in parallel that used to happen in series. And in addition to that, by building a whole set of the work indoors, you can you know, have the potential for increased quality control and decrease the risk of having weather delays or damage to materials by being left outdoors. So there's a, a sort of set of clear advantages to the modular process. However... Two parts are now a different process to before. Obviously, the on-site construction is different because instead of doing things in piece by piece on the construction site, you're picking up a whole module. But the part that a lot of people miss is that the design process itself is different to the fact that before you're typically doing one-offs and dealing with a whole set of different setups in our fragmented and sort of agglomerated construction industry with different trades. And... This doesn't mean it's a wrong process or a bad process, so much as the fact that you cannot approach a modular design project thinking it's going to be exactly the same as how you normally design in what is typically a more one-off individual process that we do traditionally. So these are some of the issues that I want to discuss in this video. Um, modular is growing. You know, these are some slightly about year-old statistics. But look, it's growing, it's not dominating the market, but it's a part of the market. So that's why it's important. And it's difficult. You know, there's a bunch of uh, firms that have closed recently in terms of at least their modular construction arms, whether it's Skender, whether it's Forest City Ratner, um, and also the incredibly well-funded Katera that closed down as well. And that means, there's again, there's nothing wrong about building something in a modular approach. But getting it right is the hard part. And modular isn't a new thing. Um, this is the house of the future, the Monsanto house of the future built in Disneyland. I actually also show it because the firm where I work, Simpson, Gumpertz and Hager, SGH. Frank Hager, the H in SGH, he was the structural engineer of this project. I mean, he worked with Marvin Goody, the architect. They both um, worked and uh, taught at MIT. Um, so sort of that academic practical academic practice com combination. Um, we've got the original design report in our library, which is fascinating. And not just as this happened to be a structural plastic design project, but it had modularity as part of its fundamental concept. And I thought I'd just share for fun, the um, this is the sort of load test photograph at the time. What you often hear is modular structures are just like shipping containers. And that's understandable because this, right? You, are, uh, you see these everywhere. It's an incredibly efficient industry. They are these rectangular volumes that things can go in, or therefore maybe people. 
and they stack and it just seems to work and we're trying to lead to efficiency. Um, the thing is that um, this has been done on occasion. Here's an example of people sort of producing architecture out of shipping containers. But you probably noticed it hasn't uh, spread as the main approach to modular structures. And rather than go into all the details in this video, I'd like to refer you to an excellent video by Belinda Carr, C-A-R-R. -R, and she covers um, her thoughts, which I essentially agree with them, on shipping containers for construction. Um, what might be interesting to point out is if you look at the patent for shipping containers, which happen to be rectangular boxes, the key part of the patent is actually that corner connector piece, that standardization globally of a connector piece that's also used to stack, that's also used to pick and place these modules. And that's where all the intelligence is. I also hear the phrase um, that modules go together just like Legos. <clears throat> well, when I've played a lot with Legos, as I'm sure you have, you know, Legos aren't all rectangular like people picture. There's a whole variety of Lego shapes that are out there. <clears throat> and again, you can see the theme of patterns. Um, that the connector part of Lego is where the intelligence is. And it's a really genius move. Um, first up, you know, when you see kids putting together, there's no instruction manual for how two pieces of Lego go together. You give them to kids, they, they understand it, and they click together. But also, just think about it, that design solution for the connector allows for two Lego pieces to go together and result in something that is more dimensionally accurate than the tools, the hands, of the people who put it together. That rarely happens, right? And so that's a really interesting thing to think about. So I want to flag up that modular construction is an option. We have a vast array of options in our construction industry that already exist. There's a whole set of supply chain and trades and trained people knowing what they're doing, who've worked together in different formats, who have figured out ways of building buildings. So when modular comes into it, as opposed to thinking about it as something that might replace everything, because it isn't coming into an empty market, modular construction is coming into a a crowded market in a fragmented industry. So I want to, you to sort of consider that it's always an option. And I'm giving you as an example that when we want to cook food, we can grill food, put it on gas, we can deep fry it, uh, we can put it in an oven. And then along came microwaves. And microwaves, look at them, they were newer, it's a rectangular thing, and they were quicker, like modular structures, right? You can see it. But m microwaves didn't replace everything. They just became another option of how to cook. And that's the sort of right way to think about this, I think. And so a key question, if you're looking to do a modular design and construction project, whether it's as part of a building, as part of a set of modules, whether it's your own startup company or a larger firm, whatever that might be, I found one of the critical questions, if not the critical questions, at least in my experience, is to understand what are we standardizing and what is going to be variable. Because after all, this is not going to be a one-off where everything can be custom and unique. It is something where there has to be a level of repetition. And where, where that level is and where cutoff points are is pretty critical to the business success. And so as a structure engineer, I'll give you a really quick example. I'm gonna show you a couple of quite outdated um, maps um, of the US, but I'm, it's to make a point. So here is a snow load map of the US. I know it's a lot of detail, but let me oversimplify with some colors. The northeast of the US is where we get the majority of snow. Okay, that makes sense. Let's think about wind. Well, the windiest parts of the US are the sort of southeast and coastal areas, not the northeast. And if we oversimplify uh, seismic, other than this particular location over here, the, on the west, the sort of California and coast of California is where our highest seismic uh, design requirements are. So if you wanted a modular approach for the United States and you wanted to standardize it everywhere, let's say, then you would be designing this module for a California earthquake, a New Hampshire snow, Vermont snow, and a Florida hurricane. Something which it would never see all three of, 
but it might see one of if you put it in one of those locations, or it might see nowhere close to that if you put it somewhere else in, in the country. So I know that's an extreme example, but, but that becomes quite important in understanding what the problem is you're trying to solve and what extent you have to go to, because you're not planning to do every single project as a one-off design, because you want the efficiencies of modularity. And another way of thinking about it then is, is, is the object or module what we should be standardizing, or is it the interface between the modules that we should be standardizing? Um, this has been done a few times. Like, this is the Lloyds of London by Richard Rogers, an amazing building in the, in the city of London, um, where the, the uh, bathrooms and the stairs, they were sort of prefabricated and plugged in. You often hear that phrase, plugged in, when it comes to prefab for buildings. So there's a sort of standard interface. So think about it this way. If you take a piece of Lego, you break it apart, separate it, and then you could just sort of place in the middle whatever you want, but you've standardized the, the way things interface to each other. This is a sort of conceptual approach. And we actually worked with a client of ours, uh, Z Modular, who had a similar approach to this. And they called it the vector block, which are these cast steel corner connection pieces, essentially an architecturally focused version of the shipping container solution. <clears throat> and then between each of these cast steel corner pieces, you could put whatever you wanted. And um, it typically was a rectangular module, but therefore the dimensions could vary. We did this um, on a, a few projects. Uh, this is one of them in the DC area. Uh, and it's modular. It doesn't obviously look like it's definitely modular. You can't read each of the boxes, but each of them are in there. Um, and, and this is sort of the diagram of how it's put together. And you'll start to also see another theme when it comes to modularity, that during design, you have to be more organized than you are normally in terms of a, a finer grain of detail. And it's a really great system. These things start to look a bit like Lego, Ikea, you know, process-oriented construction. So a couple of things to be aware of. I call them, uh, these two things, double trouble. Um, these are things that I think are a little bit more unique to modular structures and sometimes get missed. So part one of two is what I call the node problem, right? When, when you have uh, a normal uh, construction, you've got pieces coming together. When you've got modules, you have got a ton more pieces coming together than you did before. So notice you've got here, this is the corner of the Z modular system. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve pieces all coming together to this zone, right? Okay. In our structural world where we model and simplify how these uh, connections are made, it might, and I won't go into necessarily into the detail of it, but the key part to understand if these are center lines of the pieces is, can we do it in this number of pieces or not? When we came onto this project, there had been another structural engineering firm um, that had done slightly different and simplified approaches. And we realized that actually when you, when you work and think through the connector and the behavior of this unique piece, you need to be dealing with something that's far more accurate and refined in the way that this is modeled. Each of these different colors represent different structural properties. Now, again, this doesn't mean that module is bad or worse. It just means you have to think about what's different about this. And the, the node being a series of different items coming together has to be thought about both from the design analysis part of you and the physical assembly point of view, right? And then you can get the benefits of that effort. Part two of two on double trouble is what I call the stack effect. <clears throat> now, this affects more these sort of timber framed podium structures that we see everywhere across the US right now. Um, these are common because you have sort of one program at the ground floor level, which might be retail or office. And then you want to, and then above it becomes a set of residential units that have a different column layout. So you often have a podium at this sort of raised level here. And when there's residential units above, these can often be and often are timber framed because timber framing in the, the US at least is the common approach to residential. Therefore, if you're trying to do a modular approach for these uh, projects, you would typically do timber framed res uh, modules as well, or you can. So something to consider about timber structures, and this applies to all timber structures since the beginning of time, right? Um, and this, this is from directly from a, a Great Woodworks document that's freely available online. Um, all timber has moisture when it's cut and then when it's brought to site and built, and then over time it dries and it shrinks. So with the, what's drawn here is a standard framing on uh, a timber framed building. 
Oops. And as you get, this is a direct quote from their document. So just taking roughly a moisture content MC of 19% and going to detail, the point being is that typical timber construction shrinks by about a quarter of an inch per floor as the wood does its sort of first stage of drying out. It'll obviously cycle with weather and, and different conditions, but there is that fundamental first step. That means pretty much all five floor timber frame uh, residential buildings shrink by about an inch and a quarter. Okay, that's fine. That, that's pretty standard all around. However, when you deal with the stacking of different elements for a modular timber uh, design, you have got more timber than you did before right? Roughly 21 and a half inches. This is just an example from a different project. In that case, for the same, all conditions being the same, the same moisture uh, content reduction as it dries, you get to, for five floor building, about a total of two inches. Okay, is that really a big deal? Well, it's almost twice as much shrinkage as there is in a normal five floor building. And to the extent that everyone involved is used to building these buildings that you see on the left, where they put in the MEP, you know, the pipes, ductwork, they put finishes, flooring, doors, doors, hinges, carpets, and they're all building in the way with that is typically the expectation to suddenly have, or to have a project where there's almost twice the shrinkage in the building can start to cause all sorts of other localized problems that aren't necessarily a structural problem, but will initially be a whole series of other problems to bent pipes, floors being uneven, doors not quite closing properly. So a lot of frustrating things and potentially dangerous things. So keep these things in mind. And so related to all of this as well is, as you can start to hear me talk about process in all of this, is, is the communication and the transfer of information becomes super important than, and even more so than it does on a, on a typical one-off building. Um, this is a picture of um, inside the Blue Homes factory. As I said, they were my client, and this was their factory out in California. Um, and this is a blurred out drawing. It's not your eyes. So I blurred out uh, one of their drawings. I'm going to show you two drawings. And this is a drawing in their, in their factory. And this essentially showed, I can lead you through it, that the whole house, an element in the house, what it looks like in 3D, all the pieces you need, how it's going to get laid out, and all the connections. So suddenly the drawing, a singular drawing, is a very well thought through piece because it explains the big picture and the detailed picture. And it's, it's very easy for people to understand and to communicate between the intent of the design and the construction. And equally, again, blurred out drawing, as they got to the construction site and they had specific connections on site, there were these one-off sheets that showed one location in the building, how it's gonna get connected together, an inside and an outside view. And therefore, everyone could understand what was going on. This is not the kind of um, type of drawings that are produced as standard in construction because they don't need to be. But thinking about this for modular and the process of modular construction, they are. Blue Homes actually went on and they, they did a whole set of different types and models of houses that got assembled together in different ways. Um, I said this was their factory. Over time, they, they grew and then they, they shrunk for, for different issues. Um, and... In that same space is now another company doing modular structures called Factory OS. So, um, you know, I hope, I hope they do well um, through all of this. So I cannot stress enough, because you've been hearing this too many times maybe, is thinking about how you develop an idea, how you develop a process, and how you communicate that process through all stages of the project is critical. And I want to refer you, there's a great article by Brian Potter called Another Day in Cateradice. Um, related to um, Katera and their existence and their, the fact that they closed. And his quote saying, there never ended up being systems in place to facilitate different business units working together is very insightful. Notice there's nothing of a structural engineering problem here. And in fact, I've, I've raised a few that people need to think about and have actually caused other people issues. But consider in all of this that modular construction is an option doesn't have to be everything and, and the, the solution to all at, at all points. And it's a process. And if you can think about things as a process, if you can put system thinking in place and connect everything together, then you vastly increase your chance of success on your project or your company or your startup or whatever you might be trying to achieve if you're considering doing a design and construction projects related to 
a modular approach. So I hope that helped um, and that you learned a few things from, from my perspective, at least in my experiences. Thanks.